Should be on now, anytime. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to um, this session around environmental and climate data. And thanks for showing up here on this sunny afternoon. Actually, we were hoping it was raining so everyone would flock in, but we actually, the people still come in anyway, so that's good. Um, my name is Wim Zweinenberg. Uh, I work for PAX and Bellingcat, uh, a contributor to Bellingcat. And today, we're going to give you a hands-on workshop on uh, environment and climate data. But before we go there, we'll do a short introduction, so I'll move over to my colleagues next to us. Sure. Um, geez. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Oli Ballinger. I'm a lecturer in geocomputation at uh, the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis in London um, at the University College of London. It's a mouthful. Didn't come up with it. Um, I also am a contributor and tech fellow at Bellingcat. Um, Wim and I have worked together on sort of environmental investigations. And yeah, over the years, we've, we've made use of a variety of different geospatial data sets, um, everything from remote sensing to um, other sort of forms of, of spatial data on the environment. And our idea for this session was basically to have um, an interactive, more interactive session where we run through a bunch of like practical ways to access and process um, geospatial environmental data for environmental investigations. Yeah, a bit of background for my own work. I work for PAX, which is a Dutch peace organization, and basically we start to use environmental data where we're doing research on conflict and pollution and how environmental damage from conflict affects health of people and, and the environment. And Basically, we were sort of uh, forced in, uh, because there was a lack of data on environmental issues in conflict zones, and because you can't access there, it has, had, for a long time, had low priority, so we had to resort to using open source and spatial information to get a document the environmental impact. So here's a couple of works we did in the last couple of months on deforestation in Syria, and we're also doing a project on, uh, together with Center for Information and Resilience on documenting environmental harm in the war in Ukraine. And we have a couple of reports out and a couple of more reports coming. And basically what we do is we use data-driven uh, advocacy. So we take the reports and the findings and we're trying to uh, advocate for um, mitigating and stopping environmental damage or ensure that it's been addressed in environmental and in response post conflicts and then strengthening the legal protection of the environment uh, around armed conflict. So what do you can expect today? So we got, Ollie's going to do a really great introduction into remote sensing. Um, they're launching a new um, application today on Bellingcat and which you can even see later. Um, then I'm going to do a short introduction on climate and earth observation data. So really what are portals with information on climate data, where you can access them, uh, country and case studies on environmental issues. Uh, and then I'm going to walk you through a couple of open source platforms where um, uh, earth observation and remote sensing data can be accessed and we give you uh, and lastly, we give you some case studies, um, which we're working on, but we want actually to be more interactive. So uh, we also would be interesting to see if you have something. So in that case, if you throw out something, we just do it live. And you throw in stuff at us, and we're going to look things up for you and yeah, make sure you, uh, you get stuff to do. So Aldi, over to you. Yeah, great. Um, so this is a QR code. If you scan it, if you take a picture with your phone, uh, it'll load a website. The website is a, a guide that I put together for Bellingcat. It's called um, Remote Sensing for Open Source Investigations. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through that quickly. We're going we're gonna to do sort of the, the front matter to that book. So the remote sensing introduction itself and then uh, we're gonna talk a bit about data sources. But before we do that, I assume because you're here, a lot of you are either um, have worked with this type of data before, have done environmental reporting, um, are currently working on things, or are interested in particular um, phenomena or, or data sets. So is that, is that correct? How many people here have, have like worked with satellite imagery before? Okay, fantastic. Um, how many of you, haven't worked with satellite imagery, but are interested in doing um, environmental investigations and want to learn more about it. Okay, great. That's a, 
that's like an even mix. Um, we've got, yeah, we've got several options. I mean, we can go quite like technical into, uh, so we're gonna show you a variety of, of no-code platforms, so portals through which you can access data, um, but the remote sensing for open source intelligence guide um, uses a platform called Google Earth Engine, which is a um, freely available software. This is uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's a, it has a code editor here, and below it has a map, as you would expect on, on um, Google Maps. Uh, it lets you load in satellite imagery. So in a nutshell, Google stores petabytes of satellite imagery from a variety of different sources uh, on their own servers and they've developed a platform through which you can analyze that data also on Google servers. Um, one of the issues in widening access to this type of uh, geospatial data is that it's often quite large and quite computationally expensive to run. Uh, so this is a free platform that anyone can register and use, and this guide is primarily geared towards uh, leveraging that platform. Uh, I'm not paid by Google, I really wish I was. Uh, it would make my life a lot easier. I'm not shilling for them. It genuinely is uh, a very useful platform. Um, and this graph that I put together shows uh, the use of Google Earth Engine in this line in red in scientific research over the past um, five, well, over the past 20 some odd years. It outpaces a lot of more traditional geospatial analysis platforms. So it really is a platform that is used widely for um, scientific Earth observation, but it also carries immense, immense potential for uh, open source investigations and, and things that you guys might be interested in. Okay, so I'm gonna talk briefly about remote sensing. Um, how many of you were at Micah's talk this morning, Satellite Imagery for Crisis? And I'll, I mean, we, <laughs> a few, okay, good. Actually, not that many of you, so I can just repeat what she said and you won't be too mad. Um, so, remote sensing is basically the science of, um, it, it, in sort of the area that we're going to be talking about, of observing the Earth from, from space. Um, there are two broad divisions in the, the types of sensors that are available to us. We have optical sensors. These are the sensors that you'll probably be most familiar with. So, optical satellite imagery, you know, RGB images, the type of stuff that you would see with, with the naked eye, basically. But there's also a second class of sensor called um, active sensors. These are uh, radar sensors. So they don't see the Earth by taking pictures of it from space. Rather, they send pulses of radio waves from the satellite, and they measure how much of that return signal reaches the satellite once again. So you can think of this as um, the, way, the way in which a bat sees the Earth, right? It emits a call, and it listens to a response. Um, in the process, you lose visual artifacts, things like colors and shadows, but you gain the ability to see through clouds because uh, the radio waves can penetrate clouds and uh, even image at night. Um, so Micah referenced that this morning. Uh, th that's sort of how that works. And it unlocks some, some interesting capabilities that we're gonna get into in a bit. So broadly, we have two classes of, of sensor. We have active and, and passive sensors. Um, then, one of the, like the main um, rubric by which we assess the utility of different remote sensing platforms is probably resolution. So there are actually three types of resolution. There's spatial, spectral, and temporal. So spatial resolution is probably the most straightforward, right? It's how sharp the image looks. So if we look here, we've got a sensor that is relatively low resolution. So one pixel is uh, 30 meters. So Quite, quite fuzzy, you can't really tell what's going on here, right? Uh, and this is Landsat 8. This is a publicly available um, satellite from uh, NASA. Then we've got medium resolution, which is about 10 meters per pixel. This is also publicly available um, Sentinel-2 data. It's another optical sensor that uh, the European Space Agency runs. You can kind of tell what's going on here. Um, you can probably tell that this is water and that this is sort of urban land cover. And then we've got high resolution, that's generally anything under um, a meter. The, the nomenclature here is not actually um, precise, people kind of use these terms loosely, but th that's sort of generally um, how, uh, how we talk about these things. And with high resolution imagery, you can see quite a bit of detail. Um, but 
spatial resolution isn't the only form of resolution. Um, spectral resolution is also quite important. So different materials reflect light differently, and we can exploit that to distinguish different materials uh, from each other. So the, more, the most straightforward example that um, we can probably think of is distinguishing um, vegetation from non-vegetation. So this is an image of Gillette Stadium in Boston, where I'm from, and if we look at the fields here, we can see that there's a field in the middle of the stadium and then some training fields on the outside. And to the naked eye, in the visible range of the spectrum, um, we see the color green, right? And this field looks green, and this field looks green. And if I asked you whether or not the field that the Patriots play on is real grass or fake grass, or if they train on real grass or fake grass, you couldn't tell me that from this optical image, even though it's high resolution. But if we get a lower resolution sensor like Sentinel-2, lower spatial resolution, but greater spectral resolution, we can look at parts of the light spectrum that go beyond the visible and that capture more information about the material. So um, plants have chlorophyll, um, plants reflect wavelengths of light in the near-infrared part of the spectrum, like I touched on this this morning, and we can exploit that fact even though we can't see it with the naked eye, right? This just looks green to us. If we calculate an index based on the, um, like that part of the, of the spectrum, the near-infrared part of the spectrum, we can see that the fields outside of the stadium show up as bright red, strongly reflect um, near-infrared, and are thus probably actual real vegetation, but the field in the stadium itself isn't. Um, so we've now distinguished fake grass from real grass using um, wavelengths of light that we can't see with our eyes. So the sensors that we use, you know, sp uh, spatial resolution is important, but it's not the most important, depending on the use case that you have at hand. Spectral resolution can also unlock new insights. Uh, and then finally, temporal resolution is a factor. How frequently can you get imagery of the same place on Earth? Um, Sentinel-2 has a revisit rate of five days, which means that it can image the same point on Earth roughly once a week, slightly more than that. This is a, a nice visualization uh, ISA have put out. But um, other closed source or more expensive um, satellite imagery sources can image the Earth up to 12 times per day. So by launching many satellites at different orbital trajectories, they can achieve much higher revisit rates. So depending on your use case, um, you probably want to consider these three factors when using satellite imagery. Spatial resolution, how sharp is the image. Spectral resolution, how much of the electromagnetic spectrum are we collecting data on and can we use. And temporal resolution, how frequently do I need new imagery. Um, are there any questions about any of those three concepts before we move on to looking at different data sources? There never are questions when you ask it like that. Um, okay, well, so, so those are three sort of broad, broad metrics by which you can assess what type of um, satellite imagery might be useful for you uh, in a particular use case. So now I'm just gonna run through a couple different categories of remote sensing or uh, a lot of like machine learning applications which we might uh, get to if we have time um, can be used quite straightforwardly with optical imagery. So for example here, um, I've trained a neural network to identify different types of um, vehicle using optical imagery. So it can automatically, you feed it a high res satellite image and it will automatically identify helicopters, planes, small vehicles, but you could easily train it to identify um, anything else. And one of the case studies down here, object detection runs through how to do that. Um, then the, the rest of this page on, on this guide is formatted in a, a very structured way. It has a description of the type of imagery, some potential applications, and um, a table that has the name of the sensor, including a link to the platform, the time frame that it covers, uh, the spatial resolution, and the coverage. So well, what parts of the Earth are covered by it? So here we have a bunch of different um, sensors. We've got the Landsat satellites, 
um, and their respective time frames, the Sentinel-2 satellite and a couple, a couple other ones, and you can easily compare you know, which data set would be most useful to your use case. Um, so these are all optical satellites in this table. Um, but as I mentioned before, we've got a whole second class of satellites called uh, synthetic aperture radar satellites. These are the active sensors, the ones that see like bats. And those don't generate optical, uh, well, data that, um, they, they don't generate pictures, basically. So you have to interpret them slightly differently. But this, as you can probably infer, is, an, uh, is a radar image of sort of a, a marine setting. So we've got a port and we've got some ships and um, we've got this. Uh, I wonder if anyone has encountered this type of thing before in radar imagery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we wouldn't, we don't know a priori whether or not that would be like a, a military radar. Some um, naval radars are, are strong enough to interfere. This is not really related uh, to the rest of this presentation, but some ground-based military systems use the same frequency as um, the satellite, uh, the, the synthetic aperture radar satellite, and generate interference. And it looks like this. And you can use that to find um, certain systems like Patriot missiles or S-400s that generate this type of interference. Uh, but they're also, this radar satellite is very useful, as we're gonna see soon, uh, for detecting things like oil spills on water, um, but also uh, you know, seeing through clouds and detecting land cover changes as well. Um, we then got nighttime lights, which is satellite imagery taken at night. Uh, that's very useful for uh, detecting things that might be not really that visible during the day, but maybe quite bright at night. This is a fun visualization that um, Wim and I worked on for an article that shows the fall of Mosul to ISIS. So here we have Mosul, then it gets captured by ISIS and the city darkens considerably. Then you can see the front line emerging, pushing towards Mosul, and then it being recaptured by the KRG and brightening again. Um, at the same time, we've got Erbil, which stays bright the whole time. And below we have um, these bright areas here, which are flaring from um, uh, oil extraction. So the, the burning of excess methane from, from oil extraction. Um, so nighttime lights, particularly useful if you're interested in tracking um, uh, like oil extraction or uh, yeah, petrochemical uh, companies. Then we've got climate and atmospheric data. So this measures the level of different uh, compounds in the air. Uh, you've got pollutants like nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide, very harmful to breathe in, common byproducts of combustion. Um, this is an example of a um, sulfur plant in Mishraq in Syria uh, that was attacked by uh, ISIS and set on fire. And the, it released a cloud of sulfur that basically spanned to the Arctic Circle, Japan, Libya, and Tanzania simultaneously. So it released a plume of sulfur dioxide that spanned like almost around the world. Um, and you can access this type of data uh, in, by following these links. Then there are also, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh man, we could spend like we could spend all day on this one. Uh, I mean, you've got like industrial activity in northern China, right? Coal plants burning coal. Um, heavy industry produces a lot of sulfur dioxide. Uh, you've got volcanic activity in parts of Africa. Um, some really active port cities because you know these big um, tankers burn really dirty fuel that releases lots of sulfur dioxide. You can actually see shipping lanes if you look faintly um, right here. Yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but you can see a lot of industrial activity um, by virtue of the emissions that they generate. So uh, you can also get data on mineral deposits. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about South Sudan recently, and if you think about the political economy of a lot of conflicts, mineral deposits are highly relevant source of income for rebels a lot of the time. Uh, I'm speeding up because one's looking at me. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we've got f uh, fires. You can detect fires quite easily from space. Um, because they burn very brightly. We actually checked this earlier, but this morning I looked out there and there was a fire somewhere over there and we found it on firms. Um, so it's, it's quite good at detecting um, hotspots and what those hotspots mean 
depend on, on the context that you're looking at, but this is a, a screenshot of fires over Ukraine in the past year. Um, you know, many people have, have looked at this, but it, it very clearly sort of traces the outline of, of the front line in the war. Uh, and then finally, we've got population density estimates. Um, those are generated in a kind of complicated way that involves merging like administrative statistics with building footprints and stuff like that, but they let you get a rough estimate of the number of people in different areas. Uh, so if you need to check like uh, how many people, if you see, for example, um, uh, like lots of emissions coming from a particular facility uh, and you want to estimate roughly how many people might be affected by that, this type of data is very useful. Then um, building footprints, similar, uh, similar use case, right? Uh, gauging exposed populations. Uh, building footprint data sets have recently become widely available and then administrative boundaries uh, also may be useful for figuring out, like calculating totals um, of, of uh, various like pollutants or um, you know if you're calculating the flooded area um, you would need to know sort of the spatial extent of the administrative area that you're interested in and then there's also a data set on uh, georeferenced um, uh, power plants and they're disaggregated by type and uh, the amount of energy that they produce so that was a very quick introduction to all of the different types of data that are hosted on the Earth Engine um, catalog. They're also available elsewhere than the Earth Engine catalog. And uh, Wim is now gonna show you, uh, we're gonna have a more hands-on session with some of these data types and show you live how to look at and query a specific type of um, phenomenon that you might be interested in. And hopefully, if any of you have like questions or a particular use case in mind that you want us to look into live, we can, we can try to do that. We can't guarantee we'll get good results. But um, uh, yeah, if anyone, yeah, got one over here. On Earth Engine, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it is available. Directly on, on, you tried to load it on Earth Engine and it didn't work. Ah, so that's the great thing about Earth Engine is that it, um, you can run it from your phone because it's not actually running on your device locally. It's running on Google servers. You're basically submitting a request to run a computation on Google servers. So it's actually completely independent of the computational resources of your own computer, which is, which is how it sort of widens access to that. Because as you said, like environmental data, if you've got like minutely or every 15 minutes global observations on things like sulfur dioxide, you can imagine how big that data is. It's not gonna, it's gonna melt your computer. Uh, so Google have, for some reason, uh, allowed people like us to, uh, to hog their, their compute. Uh, there's something, they're doing something with it. I don't know what, but they're... <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, Wim, take it away. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to get the uh, adapter to connect. I'm not sure if someone from it doesn't seem to be uh, working. Oh, here we go. Oh, <laughs> weird. Um, I think I had the same problem that you had before when it doesn't switch to your main screen. Damn. Bear with us. Um, well, we can't see the screen. Yeah, it's not the screen here. Um, in the meantime, we can do the the Q and A. Do people have? So again, we've had people who've worked with satellite imagery before. Are there particular use cases that people are interested in or any questions on anything that we just ran through? Yeah. Extension. Ah. Yeah five years or 10 years? Yeah, so uh, the question was, um, can you get the fire data historically? Yes, um, the firm's data is historical and it runs from uh, the year 2000 to the present. And it's about, yeah, so, uh, and you can also look at burned areas, not just active fires, but uh, you could definitely do sort of historical comparisons as well, yeah. Um, 
Oh, we've got loads of questions. Do you want to do yeah, some do questions, questions now, or do you want to? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, just a quick one. So is there a simple way to um, determine what kind of plantations are the satellite imagery? Like, I would like to differentiate between soy plantation or palm oil plantation or pristine forest, blah, blah, blah. That's a fantastic segue into one of the platforms that we're going to look at in a second, uh, which lets you choose between different types of uh, like vegetative land cover, Global Forest Watch, right? Um, yeah, so we'll show you in a minute how to do that. Um, do we have one more before we move on to? Um, yes, uh, oops. I was wondering if you can see historical data of climate migration. What I mean, uh, both at the same time, the people who maybe moved and also the satellite weather data, which might be relevant, combined in one image, historically. Seeing like where people move to. Yeah, affected by massive climate change uh, impacts. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough, for, for that type of question, you often sort of have to break down the question further into like, um, what is a like sort of geophysical manifestation of that that I can see from a satellite, right? So nighttime lights, for example, very often used as a proxy for um, like population density. It correlates mm. pretty closely to that type of thing. So you can watch cities grow over time, um, establishing like causality between a city growing and yeah, climate change would be hard to do um, and probably outside the scope of what a newsroom or even like a university would be able to do. But you can certainly watch cities grow over time by how bright they are at night. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll pass it over to him to, to do some more interactive stuff now, but uh, thanks for your questions. No, these are the really good questions. And it's one of the reasons why we did this workshop, like is to, to, to ping back and forth those kind of what are the requests from the journalistic community and what's available in terms of uh, uh, remote sensing data and how where we can find each other in the middle where things are actually able to visualize things, but there are also stuff that really takes like long time to investigate where you need like on the ground research as well and ground truth thing. So, but I think what we want to do here is just to visualize, uh, to show you some of the portals where suppose you're a journalist, you're working on a story in a particular country, where do you get the data? And uh, how can you visualize some of the stuff that you want to work on? So today I'm just going to walk you through four main portals. Um, there are new ones coming up every day. It's hard to keep up with what's development, what's developing, but I think those are really, really useful. Uh, some of them have already been discussed in other sessions for different reasons, but I think it's still good to quickly dive in a couple of those. And that, that will be Sentinel Hub, which is um, uh, heavily supported by the European Union, but also it's a private company, but they're doing great work and uh, showing the, um, the EO browser. The World Research Institute, which have a se several data portals on specific topics. And today I'm just going to dive into the Global Forest Watch one. EarthMap, which is developed by the FAO. Uh, it has like also a link with Google Engine, but they have all kind of preset models loaded into it, which is really helpful to, to dive into. And, and I'm going to steal this phrase from you, uh, Micah, to use it as a canary in a coal mine, because like you have to start that one. Uh, you can look some things up, for like some general patterns, and you can always dive into more specifics. And NASA Earth uh, um, Observatory, which is also a really useful um, tool to use. So um, kicking off here. So suppose you want to look something up on, and this is done by the World Bank, which has a great portal, and you want to look up like background information on the country which hit the news. So for example, so you go to the website, let's take, uh, let's take uh, Afghanistan for no particular reason. Um, so it has a really good overview where you can immediately get like all the relevant data on what's happening on, on climate developments, and it goes really into like detail on uh, what's, what's happening there in terms of like temperature change, uh, precipitation, and then you can always dive a bit more into uh, the background of the inf of the country itself. So if you're doing, if you're a journalist, and you're looking into a uh, background of the climate data into a country, this is like a really go-to point. Um, it has a lot of data which is built on sets which is shared with the World Bank. Um, and it's just an opportunity for you just like to, to, to browse through the website. But I just want to show that like if you do background research, this is like really, really relevant and really helpful web page. Um, the next one up would be the Climate Watch database. So here uh, again, for example, we take the World Bank. Climate Watch has like all the data available on emissions. Um, uh, the goals, the, uh, there's also I think data in, in there as well, what, uh, what the uh, 
in this case, is maybe less relevant with the Taliban now. I don't think they're very much interested in uh, achieving climate goals, but uh, so think, for example, another one um, like Austria, which probably has like more documentation. And if you're going to find all these documentations to relevant websites, what kind of agreements are signed up to? I think in particular, if you want to look into accountability issues or what countries have pledged, those kind of things are very helpful just to give you background. So all these international organizations signed up to all uh, kind of agreements where they promise to share data. Um, there are international organizations doing the research themselves. Um, I think that's, as a journalist, it's very helpful. Well, suppose you want to look into, and that's another helpful tool I use a lot in research on conflict-affected countries. You want to have more information on country profiles, like on environmental stuff. I think the, the, the Convention on Biologic Diversity or, uh, has really good country profiles, which gives you a really good overview immediately with all the nitty-gritty details on environmental stuff in, uh, in countries itself. So just as a backup uh, to the... Um, uh, if you want to write a report and you want to understand what environmental issues in the country are, I think CBD has really good information. Like you can pick a country and uh, again, we take Argentina, they have to report everything. Um, my Spanish is non-existent, but suppose you have uh, speak Spanish, like it's, uh, it, and it can easily stuff that can be translated. I use it a lot as well with Google and then translate stuff from Arabic or uh, just to, to English. And it gives you a sort of good sense for, hey, this is the, uh, the environmental issues in a country. So that's more the climate portal and climate data. There are many more opportunities there. Uh, I don't, don't go into them all, uh, but I just want to flag those two because I think it's, it has credible data and reliable data. Um, <clears throat> next up, um, I promise to go into Sentinel Hub, and this is um, just a general overview. This is Sentinel Hub here. I took the uh, EO browser, which is um, semi-free, there's a free version, but you have limited access to imagery. Um, there is also access for journalists and researchers for free, and you can also apply to kind of grants uh, on, on the EO browser. Um, but uh, I want you now, uh, and, uh, and there's also, of course, a paid version, um, but I think for people in the room here, you should be able to get access to it. So I want to take an example here, uh, looking at South Sudan. South Sudan is a country where we've been looking at for our work on looking into like what the impacts are in flooding, if flooding is getting more extreme. In particular, we were looking at like what are the risks of flooding to um, oil facilities. Um, and um, here, for example, you, you go to the location, uh, it gives you all kinds of themes. So they have all kinds of special, special thematic themes of Earth observation data, uh, both uh, radar, uh, so optical and radar data. In this case, um, we're going to check, we use uh, floods and droughts. Um, it, use, it looks here for Sentinel-2. So we look here, and I know for this, for example, this I take you just to this location. This is uh, at Balu, Baluch in, um, in uh, Upper Nile. So here you see all these um, oil um, expo exploitation sites where they dig up oil. And next to these sites, you see all these kind of drilling pits where they uh, put the wastewater. And the reason we looked into this because our partners from South Sudan were concerned over flooding and how the, the floods and the oil spills get into the water and then people already, of course, have to flee the flood, so there's a big humanitarian situation, but we're also concerned because many people here have a lot of cattle and cattle were dying. Uh, people were concerned about health effects from the oil getting into uh, water sources. So we want to see, okay, can we just see how the floods are affecting the oil fields? So here I'll just quickly visualize it. This is natural color, so this is like how you would see it normally. Um, and the floods were happening in January, so we go to um, January this year. And then you can see here, uh, this is normal color, you see all these, this is water which has flooded uh, a couple of these locations. And what we did, we manually f mapped all the um, oil pits here uh, and trying to see if they were flooded. Um, but there's also other kind of options, so here this is the non-difference uh, water index, which gives you the reflection, picks up like what's water and what's uh, soil. So in this case, you can see it. And it's also, this one is a tricky one because the floods in South Sudan are not like, you know, a couple of meters high floods. In some locations there are, but sometimes it's also like 30 centimeters or less. So it's, so it's always not super strong, but it gives you an idea like where the water is reaches. And what's nice here, you can also make like a time lapse. So for example, you want to see, um, if what's happening, and then you can select, like I want to see all the imagery from um, the flooding seasons, take September, 
you're trying to let, get as less clouds as possible. Um, let's take a week because a day it takes long. And it collects all the imagery over a certain time and then creates a small um, uh, movie or uh, animation where you can see, I can speed it up for time's sake. Um, so here you see the flooding was used to be worse before and then sort of slowly disappears over time until it runs until yeah, January. So it gives you a good indication, okay, so there's, uh, there is flooding. Um, we use high resolution imagery to identify the sites. We could use this one to demonstrate the flooding. Uh, and then there's always good to double check things. So for example, here I looked at the World Bank, if they have anything on flooding. Um, here, the um, uh, South Sudan has, uh, the UNICEF had, had done some really good research on, um, no, I lost the location where I had, oh here. So they have like flood monitoring on South Sudan. So this is like AI generated flood modeling. So you can see already here compared with the other ones. So this is where the UNEP did uh, a uh, flooding model. Uh, they made a flooding model using artificial sort of intelligence. And I think it was based on radar imagery, if I'm correct. Um, but you can see that it's missing things. So it's always good to, um, and this is the location we were just looking at. So it's here. And you can see there was less flooding in this oil field in March than we saw earlier. Um, and you can also download this, this map immediately. But it's a good visualization of uh, flooding. Um, and let's take another example here uh, on um, wildfires. So in Spain, there was a wildfire, wildfire season was starting earlier this year. So if, suppose you want to look into wildfires. Uh, again, you use EO browser. They have a special wildfire script uh, as well. Um, here, I think I used uh, a normal, uh, this is the normal vegetation, how it normally looks like. I already sort of preset it because uh, just for, for uh, time's sake, but there was a, um, here we use the um, shortwave infrared, which gives a nice, uh, both shows the vegetation, but also shows um, the fire itself from the infrared from the flight, from the fire. So this was before the fire, and then uh, five days later, you can see the area is totally burned. Uh, you can still see some fire smoldering here. Um, and suppose you want to check that. In this case, I checked, I uh, looked up with the um, Copernicus. Uh, it's also a, a map used by European Union, which shows all the fire data, in particular in the season at the moment, of the, and climate change induced fires are likely increasing. So this is a very helpful tool where you can uh, you should just play around with the website. I'm not going to talk about it in details, but here you see the same location where they gave out a warning and there were detected fires here using um, the, uh, what uh, Oli mentioned earlier, the, uh, the VIA script, and it, and it sort of maps this here, and there's actually also a possibility here to um, visualize burned areas, but I think this is not going back. Yeah, so here it automatically calculates um, the burned area with modus. So you can also can get like an overview of how much was burned. Um, so uh, these are just, just two applications, so looking at flooding and looking at fires. We use it for many, many other um, uh, um, issues, um, oil spills as well. Um, but moving on now to data sources. So I mentioned the World Research Institute. I think um, also, I don't have a GIS background. Most of all this stuff I learned by just trying this thing, trying these tools, uh, talking with people who actually did study this stuff. There's a great online community where people are helping each other, where experts are there. Uh, and so it helps you to understand also like how to uh, access data, how to read data, what it actually mean that you're looking at. Um, and this was very, this was, was interesting for me. So back in 2017, we were looking at this and I wanted to look at, um, uh, so I used it. So basically, the, the World Research Institute have a, a bunch of uh, portals. We already discussed Climate Watch a little bit. I'm now going to show you Global Forest Watch. So this is um, part, of, part of my work is looking at the environmental impacts of the conflict in Syria. So I was looking back at this back then. It's like, hey, uh, this is interesting. Uh, there's a lot of deforestation going on in Syria. And what it does, uh, you can just go by country. You can click on a country. You can click on a region. and it, ask you to analyze it, and then you get a complete overview, in this case from Latakia, and it shows you how much uh, forest deforestation took place between uh, in the last uh, 20 years. So clearly you see here, after 2011, 
there was a massive increase of forest loss. This is based on a preset a database from Hansen, which uses Landsat imagery. Um, but for us, it was this, which is relatively its functions, but it's a relatively crude model. Um, so we use this database to uh, identify where the main areas are. Um, you can actually, um, well, I'm not going to do that now, uh, but it's like it's it's helpful to get an indication, and then we we developed our own script with our in-house uh, GIS expert. And we did it for the whole country and we looked at all the deforestation in the conflict, which was linked mostly to uh, more people needing firewood because fuel prices were getting up. Uh, there were a lot of IDPs. Um, there was deliberate burning of forests, so it's quite, quite intense. Um, so there's, uh, there's that. Uh, so Global Forest Watch is very helpful. I um, already mentioned um, EarthMap. So the, again, uh, you should play around with this. It's just a website where, uh, based on Google Earth Engine, where you can look at all kinds of issues. Uh, here, look at Syria. You want to look at, um, is there anything interesting here on Syria on extinction? Um, well, this is probably not working. Uh, what let fire? So it gives you a burnt area uh, overview in, in Syria over the last couple of years. And the frequency, there's one on uh, I think we even go by country, so you can see when was inc uh, when a lot of fires were happening. But this is more interesting because this is mostly related to uh, stop burning. Uh, but still, suppose you want to look into areas here, we can see as more fires going on during conflict areas. We can easily see all the um, the burnt areas in this. Um, again, this is a big website. There's a lot of data sets here, but I just want you to show like what kind of stuff you can look into. Um, so I got Earth map, and then I want to go to um, Earth Observatory, Earth Observatory from uh, NASA Worldview, which has a lot of different things as well. Just look at the website. I give you a quick example here, looking at dust storms. If it loads, yeah. So this is like last year. There were like major dust storms in Iraq, uh, which was into the news. And here it was happening in August. It has like really uh, large, uh, low resolution data, but it's very helpful. You can easily visualize the increase of dust storms, and you can actually make a movie if you want, but we just I'll just take the slider here, and you can see, I know this area here, it's close to Nasiriya, where there's a desert where naturally dust storms are occurring, but you can see here, um, so this, this area here. Now pay close attention, and then you see things getting increasing, increasing, so this is like a very bad area. We saw the pictures from Baghdad coming out. Um, so it's a really helpful tool to quickly show like where the impact is of all these dust storms happening in the Middle East. Um, and you can, if you want, you can make a, a nice movie with it as well here. Um, this is one example of, um, and the last one is what actually was kind of interesting we were looking into today, uh, VRS that we just mentioned, and it also shows potentially, we think, uh, the different um, environmental regulations. So here we see, this is Russia, this is Kaliningrad, here is Estonia. Uh, so apparently, European regulations likely prevent farmers from stop burning, which is not present in Russia. So you see a lot of fires here from post-harvest burning uh, going on here. Uh, again, uh, already discussed earlier. Um, also looking at the time. Uh, so the main idea was just to quickly show you where the portals are, where to find the information. Um, I'm just putting up like the, all the linkages to all these websites. So if you want to take a picture here, um, feel free to use it. Uh, and just want to come back now to uh, if there are any questions in particular for what we just discussed today. I see it's a lot of phones to, coming up. Yeah, it's like hard to distinguish the phones from the hands. Uh, yeah. Uh, the question was uh, on like radar interference, uh, these um, like ground-based missile defense systems, primarily like Patriot missiles that interfere with publicly available uh, Sentinel-1 like radar imagery. Um, they have. The European Space Agency has updated the way in which they pre-process radar imagery uh, recently, which is kind of annoying for that. But yeah, they have, which is sad. We got one in the back, yeah.
running a grant right now for any journalists interested in uh, developing services that benefit the journalism industry. Um, so yeah, please come find me after if you're interested. <laughs> Sorry, shameless plug. So can you give your name and your organization again? I think people there didn't hear it. Sorry, uh, my name is Ben from uh, European Space Agency. Thanks. I didn't mean what I said about the European Space Agency. I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? Thanks. I, Sonia. I had quite a specific question just in terms of is there a particular data set that you would recommend that kind of optimizes fairly granular thermal imaging also with relatively kind of high time frequency? Um, so planet scope data, which is, um, uh, is sort of freemium, you can access it for free, but downloading it is a bit harder. Uh, it doesn't have thermal, but it has near infrared, uh, which does let you see, uh, it does let you gain some information on, on heat. You'd really be looking for something like shortwave infrared uh, to, to look at like really thermal stuff. Um, like the Landsat program is probably your best bet as far as, as far as I know, and that's pretty bad resolution, 30 meters per pixel. There's a new company launching next year in 2024 called Albedo, who claimed they're gonna do 10 centimeter thermal image, no, 30 centimeter thermal imaging from space, which um, that would be extremely impressive, but it would definitely not be free, and also, like, also seems like pretty, um, pretty bold claims. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we got a question up front. Thank you. Just to retake the question a colleague did in the beginning of a session of uh, which one of these tools uh, can be good to differentiate uh, the types of vegetation, whether you have like a soy field or a pristine vegetation, which one of these can help us look at it? Well, I think that's that's the kind of question. I mean, it's possible, but that's, we have to go deep into uh, using the NDVI. So you have to look at specific reflections of specific plants, and you have to set certain parameters in in your your analysis, which you can do automatically. I think, um, which you have to do like manually in in the assessment. But so I think also Global Forest Watch uh, have crop maps. Also, some um, some governments provide crop maps. Um, there's also the Food and Agricultural Organization publish, um, I think, estimates of the spatial extent of different crops, but I think those are estimates. I'm forgetting off top what the name of that data set is, but I think it's, um, uh, it, has, it has an acronym, but the FAO uh, would be the place to look for, for that type of data. Um, yep. I'm doing a story coming out in a couple of weeks that is about, well, it, part of it concerns um, some people who had their homes burned by their government and they say that it happened on one side of a line and the government says it happened on the other side of the line. Would you be able to see those fires in temporal resolution if they're fairly small structures like huts? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, pass the mic uh, up and to your left because uh, the mic has worked on. <laughs> I'm kidding, uh, but um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very typical use case for for that type of imagery. Obviously, you can't guarantee anything, but I would certainly look into that. It would be uh, NASA Firms F F I R M S. Um, they do both active fires and burned areas, and uh, as I said earlier, it spans I think from 2000 onwards, and it's like daily. Um, Twice it, wow. Yeah, nice, yeah. So the firms typically is about twice a day. Um, maybe on average for the week, it's yeah. more like 10 times. Um, and it's usually sometime maybe during the night and sometime during the day. Uh, it lists the time in GMT. And uh, it depends on where you are in the world. I think if you're kind of in the extreme north and the extreme south, it might be less. Yeah. Great. Um, anyone else? Oh, yeah. Here. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, so back to that. So I have two questions here. Uh, back mm -hmm. to the first question is that the differentiation between like soy and palm oil. I think my 
uh, my idea is that you know there must be some formula that you can use to analyze the NDVI satellite imagery to get the different types. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So uh, even per per plant, like tomatoes or soy or whatever, so yeah. you have to know the specific parameters of the plant, and then you can distinguish them. All right, and that can be done through the GE, right? The Google Earth Engine. Yeah. Um, so th there's like the easy way of doing this and the hard way of doing this. The easy way, like I would, if you're looking for the spatial extent of different crops, that is something that governments and organizations... No, not government. So like we want to detect the changes. So don't, not yeah. based on the government data. No, uh, so, so they will do geospatial analysis, like the US government or the, F the Food and Agricultural Organization yeah. of the UN. Yeah, but we're talking that countries that don't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the Food and Agricultural Organization does global... Um, mm -hmm crop extent maps, if I'm not mistaken. If you wanted to do it the hard way yourself, it would involve looking at like the growing season of a particular crop, loading in imagery, uh, like NDVI uh, imagery for that period, and then looking at um, whether or not this crop, like the vegetation in a particular field, corresponds to the growing season of a particular crop. So you can do that, but it's a, it's a lot more complicated to do, mm -hmm. and uh, I would be, 1,000% sure that there isn't uh, a crop map for that crop that already exists because loads of organizations, not just governments, um, do this type of analysis. So only do it yourself if you absolutely have to, but if you have to, it can be done. Yeah, because we are, like, we are trying to detect like illegal plantation yeah. deep in the forest, mm. so those data is not available yeah. uh, from the government. Yeah. Um, so you could uh, certainly distinguish between like forest and mm. um, like a soybean because those are very different. Uh, structures. Um, you could look at planet data as well, um, especially for deforestation. If you do a time lapse uh, yeah. in a particular area, you can see um, the forest being clear cut and, and agriculture right. we did, replaced. We, did, we, we do use uh, GFW. Uh, yeah. A second question is about access to high resolution satellite um, imagery. You have any advice for journalists or newsrooms? You know, it is very tough to get below like, sub um, one meter imagery and they are not they are expensive so yeah. what are some of the ways that you are able to assess them so th a couple of options here so for example uh, there are um, if you engage with for example planet they will offer um, free imagery to a journalist also high resolution which is a, for the planet is like 0 0.5 from sky set um, there are also options if you have a like, smaller budget for example through EO browser you can also buy um, for a Maxar or Airbus imagery for like really low prices and there was a new one which I haven't used yet but it's uh, it's out now which was used Skywatch yeah so you can buy it per square meet square kilometer I think this is a minimum one or even smaller so you pay like uh, yeah like a couple of ten yeah ten dollar twenty dollars for something you look into. I mean, you can also do the same through EO browser, which has all these data things as well, and it's relatively easy, and uh, I use it all the time if I don't have access to the other sources. Um, and there's also, sometimes there's really good updated imagery on, uh, sent on uh, for example, on uh, Google Earth, depending on the country, but like sometimes they have even up to 2023, they have uh, on Google Earth Pro, the desktop version, they have uh, um, really recent data, but it really depends on the country. Okay, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, uh, but if anyone wants, has burning questions about uh, environmental data, the corner women I at some point, we're around for the next day or so. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, it's been really fun. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Everybody's Sorry. gonna follow you.